Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Strange Playgrounds podcast, episode two. Um, first of all, thank you so much for those who responded to the first episode, those of you who commented and uh, shared the video. Um, it massively appreciated, enormously appreciated, and it gave me a very good, um, a very good measure of what people are responding to on this channel it was most most useful um and also very heartening very heartening because i i enjoy sitting down and rambling on about nothing very much in particular as i mentioned last time round and that's what these are generally going to be they're very impromptu they're very off the cuff i don't do an enormous amount of planning for these things uh, ever because i find it just doesn't work for me um, whenever I plan something like this out, it comes off as stilted and as lifeless and just doesn't work. I kind of like to just sit down, press record and see what happens. Although, um, I do have a kind of very loose theme or subject for this episode because it's something that's been on my mind quite a lot recently. I also... I do um, another podcast quite regularly with Adam Nickel over at uh, Riveted Sounds. Uh, links below. We do uh, the Fluff and Hammer podcast, which is a podcast about um, Games Workshop and its uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, tabletop games. It's lots of fun. We discuss the background and the influences and whatnot. There's quite a lot of crossover with this podcast in many respects. It's, it has sort of similar themes and concept um, underpinning it. But we did um, we did a video recently, which is not out yet, but which will be very soon for the Patreon backers of that particular podcast, um, exploring the influence of H.P. Lovecraft's fiction on those universes, um, which was fascinating because it allowed us to really delve deep into um, Lovecraft's law and look at how it has influenced the development of those universes. Now, one of the things we discussed is that Lovecraft is one of those writers. His his body of work is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. You really can't escape it. He's very much like J.R. Tolkien is in fantasy. Um, the genetic legacy of Lovecraft is everywhere. It's in almost all forms of genre or what would be called speculative fiction these days. It's certainly in almost all forms of horror in one way, shape or form. What I find most fascinating about Lovecraft is that even people who have never touched one of the stories, um, who don't really know a great deal about the man or his work, do know a great deal about the man and his work. They just don't realise it. They don't realise it because it's uh, the imagery, the concept, the tropes are so enshrined within culture and within the nature of fiction and cinema and imagery and art um, you just can't escape it you can't escape it all um, exposure to the man's works themselves do is give you context they give you context for where these concepts and these images come from um, and Lovecraft's an interesting one for me he He's very difficult, I think, when most people pick him up for the first time. Um, most people, I think, these days come at him from a, a, a tangential approach. They actually come at him through other fiction, for other people's works. Uh, often through video games, it has to be said. Uh, there's, there's such a strong Lovecraftian influence in video games. And not just horror video games, either. You find Lovecraftian creatures and Lovecraftian concepts in all forms of video games, in just general monster design. If you look at most role-playing games, for example, there is a Lovecraftian element going on to most of the creatures in those games. Uh, and often there's a very specific Lovecraftian homage or reference in those video games um or all through cinema through stuff like john carpenter's the thing for example through the the alien franchise which has a very heavy lovecraftian um influence upon it um really through any anything that involves very large monsters that have tentacles and tendrils or that involves um some form of sentient knowledge or some sort of forbidden knowledge that is sort of 
corrupting by its very nature that just by acknowledging it or experiencing it, it it can transform you it can drive you mad it can um alter your state of mind fundamentally that's all that comes from lovecraft all of that is lovecraftian subject matter or imagery um for me i didn't come to him until very very late on um given the stuff i was exposed to throughout my childhood you know the fact that i'd you know, I'd started to read Barker by the age of 11, the, uh, Stephen King even earlier than that, the stuff like Ramsey Campbell and whatnot around the same time. Um, it's surprising that I didn't actually have any Lovecraft to read when I was a kid. Um, I found him because of references. Um, Stephen King talks about him quite a lot and the, he, the impact that Lovecraft had on his work. Um, I mean, King would have been about the right age when he was a kid or when he was a young man anyway to be exposed to Lovecraft because Lovecraft had a kind of renaissance in the the late 1970s and early 1980s he had this this resurgence in the same way that Michael Moorcock did um, they became very popular again, and they started to influence culture. They started to to influence uh, filmmaking and other writers and art and even music and bands and whatnot. Very very peculiar. Um, but King's King is very very complimentary about Lovecraft. He he's ba- in on writing his uh, work on writing. He basically states that without Lovecraft there would be no Stephen King. It's as simple as that. Um, he was heavily inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, and I think on one of the collections I have knocking about here, there's a quote by Stephen King in which he calls Lovecraft um, the the twentieth century's uh, dark and baroque prince of horror, or something to that effect. Um, and that's fairly accurate. That is fairly accurate. Um, I found I when I came to Lovecraft, as a lot of people my age and my generation do, I find him very difficult to take. I didn't actually like his work very much, um, and that's because of a lot of factors. He is an acquired taste. He's like eating olives or or, or blue cheese or uh, or drinking wine you don't like the first taste, you don't like the first mouthful or the first few mouthfuls, you have to sort of acquire or contrive the delight of it and then the enjoyment actually becomes legitimate, it's it's an odd thing. Um, when I first came to read him I found him, I found him overly verbose, adje- um, adjective ridden, very very difficult to read on a stylistic level um, because there are elements of his prose style certainly from his earlier work that are risible absolutely risible he will use five adjectives when one or none will do he uses all of these archaisms these old old forgotten words like squamous and batrachian and eldritch and gibbous and all of these very very peculiar terms that do have a kind of innate poetry but because (laughs) lovecraft has this tendency in his earlier tales to overuse them somewhat and as a result they can become risible they can become humorous uh which he did not intend it's not until later on you have to sort of persevere with lovecraft and then you start to appreciate what he was doing you start to appreciate the just the the sincere ambition of the man i mean the the ambition of his imagination is insane he was going for a scope of horror that hardly anyone working at the time was his horror is almost universally cosmic it's not intimate horror like a lot of horror is certainly the more recent um forms of horror it's not about the sensual nature of horror um or the intimate nature of horror it's vast and metaphysical and cosmic it's about it's about humanity's place in the universe and its relation to reality which and to time there's a great sense in um in lovecraft stories of cosmic time um that is the notion that the universe is so vast and so ancient and so inconceivably old by human standards that we can't even begin to appreciate our place within it we are a speck we're an ephemeral nothing i mean all of human history is an ephemeral nothing you know when we end when we finally end and it's quite likely we will destroy ourselves um it seems then our history will be nothing 
it will mean nothing there is no grander purpose to humanity the universe is indifferent to us and in lovecraft's case it's not just indifferent it's actually entirely hostile to us the best you can hope for in lovecraft's mythology is that you don't get noticed that humanity doesn't draw the eyes of entities that are so far beyond us they are imperceptible let alone conceivable um that's the best we can hope for that we are ignored and that we we wink out quietly um, and without fanfare in lovecraft's fiction that doesn't happen in lovecraft's fiction what happens is humanity humanity starts scrabbling and pouring at things that it shouldn't it starts to explore notions that would be better off left alone and then ultimately ends up unleashing something terrible something that is going to damn the entire species to an eternity of madness and of mutation and of dereliction and disgrace and there's nothing you can do about it there's nothing humanity can do about it there are these entities in Lovecraft's fiction that are godlike. They're semi divine or at least infernal to our perceptions, but they're not gods. Not as we would understand them. What they are are extra dimensional entities that operate on levels of reality we can't perceive or conceive of. That's what they are. And as a result, humanity attaches divine aspects to them, but they don't care about us. To uh, At the very best, we are nothing. We're like fleas on their backs, or we're cattle. Um, there are entities like Cthulhu, um, which can drive human be all of humanity mad just by waking up. Um, just by rising from its dreams. There are entities like Atzathoth, which is the creator of all. Atzathoth is Lovecraft's notion of the divine, and it is entirely nihilistic. It's madness. And Atzathoth is not a conscious creator entity. He's the madness at the heart of all creation. All realities, not just this one, all realities and permutations of reality erupt spontaneously from Atzathoth at once and die the same. Because he's mad. He is madness. He is this lunatic idiot dreaming god that endlessly and without purpose or wider poetry or intention dreams all realities into being. And that's all reality is in Lovecraft's uh, universe. It is the product, the byproduct, in fact, of this lunatic god's dreaming dribblings. And that's... um. It is the ultimate nihilism. There is, the fact that there is metaphysics, but it's hideous. It's hideous and has it doesn't care about humanity, it doesn't care about conscious entities, full stop. And that the universe itself doesn't really matter. Time and reality itself are arbitrary, byproducts of some wider process um, that, means it, that itself means nothing and has no end product. It's wonderful. But what you find is uh, certainly what... I found in my wider reading is that the influence of Lovecraft is everywhere. You just cannot escape it. It's quite wonderful. Um, and it's certainly a massive impact upon Stephen King's stories, as I discussed in the last uh, the last podcast. The Mist is very clearly a, deli a, a specifically Love Lovecraftian story. That's actually quite rare in King's work. You don't often get work that directly references Lovecraft. Um, although it does exist, um, there's also N, which is one of Stephen King's latest stories, which is also entirely Lovecraftian. There's the Dark Tower stories. Um, the, the Dark Tower mythos also references Lovecraft in many and varied ways. Um, but what you find more in Stephen King's works is a subtle a subtler influence like um you see the effect and the impact that lovecraft has had unconsciously upon king's work bleeding through um you don't often get nihilism in love in king king has a little bit more love for humanity than lovecraft did there is um it is certainly the case that one of the more alienating aspects of lovecraft's fiction is that he is he has not just archaic notions he has notions and um perspectives that are somewhat um 
they're somewhat difficult to square with a a postmodern human being's perspectives um certainly a creative human being's perspectives he is entirely racist there's no getting around that um entirely anti-semitic and um somewhat homophobic as well um and sort of passively misogynist i suppose he's passively misogynist in the sense that he just doesn't write about women it's an odd thing um women don't seem to hold a great deal of fascination for him um and whenever women occur in his books it is tangentially and it is for the purposes of procreation and nothing else and often a sort of twisted and hideous procreation where they are hybridized with entities from beyond the stars and end up giving birth to abominations um such as in the dunwich horror for example um, in the case of Jewish characters, there is a tendency for them to start sprouting tentacles at some point. Um, he is quite overtly racist, and that is very difficult to get over. It is very difficult to get over. Um, and for a lot of people, it is the stopping point. It's the point at which it's like, nope, can't read that. And that's fine. I totally understand that. Um, for my money, you kind of have... I look past that um and i look at the wider resonance that his work has had because he is a classic case of something of something positive coming out of something very negative the man himself was terribly racist there's no getting around that but the work he produced the way he channeled those neuroses and those anxieties um and created this new scope of horror this new platform for horror and all of this new imagery and subject matter for other horror writers to take up and play with the way he expanded the scope of horror and indeed of science fiction is amazing it's absolutely amazing. The man's imagination, despite all of these other qualities, or maybe even because of it, you you arguably wouldn't have the kind of horror that Lovecraft wrote about without his racism, without his fear of the other. Um, and that's a very interesting and difficult tension to appreciate. You also have to look at the fact that I mean, the way I uh, I find myself softening to Lovecraft the man and being more interested in him the more I read about him because the guy was damaged. There's no doubt about that. He was a neurotic mess from the earliest instance and it's hardly surprising given his background, given that his father and mother both died in insane asylums, they both died very young, his mother was abusive, he had a very abusive upbringing... He demonstrated characteristics that were not only um, depressive, possibly bipolar, but also very redolent of the autistic spectrum. Um, he was very isolated, um, did not like going outside, did not like interacting with human beings, um, would often not make eye contact with other human beings, was considered very odd, very strange, um, had no great love of humanity, was clearly a misanthrope, which comes through in his fiction... And once again, it's kind of a fun thing for for horror fiction to play with. It's an interesting tension. Um, because th there is it is arguable that a lot of horror fiction is not misanthropic, despite the, the subject matter and the imagery that it plays with. A lot of horror fiction is actually reinforcing of social narratives. I mean, you look at things like, for example, Bram Stoker, who, um, ironically, Lovecraft was heavily inspired by. Bram Stoker's work, Dracula, certainly heavily reinforces social narratives rather than questioning them. Um, and if you want to look at a real racist work, um, then, then Dracula is it. I mean, Dracula is all about Victorian racism. It's all about this this um, strange and unusual foreigner who's coming into our land and taking our women and making them like him. It's a very racist book indeed, um, and is arguably part of the reason why it was canonised. Um, and it's 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 not it's not surprising that that had a great influence upon Lovecraft. However, one of the big contrasts between Lovecraft's work and Dracula's work is that in Dracula, the monster is destroyed, the um, the foreign influence, if you like, um, is um, done away with, and the virtuosity of traditional narratives is reinforced. So things like virginity and faith and 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 um, 
uh, the the faith in in reason and tradition is all reinforced in Dracula, which it is not in Lovecraft, which is really rather interesting. Lovecraft actually bemoans the fact, very much like Edgar Allan Poe before him, bemoans the fact that tradition isn't going to save you. Tradition is not going to save any of us. That nothing can. Nothing can. There is no saving us as a species um, in Lovecraft's uh, metaphysics, in Lovecraft's mythologies. Our species is damned. It is damned either by its own hand or by things it can't, it just simply cannot control, that it has no say in. In Lovecraft's mythology, a cosmic or extra-dimensional phenomena can just come along and casually wipe us out, or casually drive us all collectively mad, or casually devolve us in the flesh and mind into tentacled abominations. That's the nature of the universe. That's the universe that Lovecraft perceives. And it is kind of everywhere in horror, even in Stephen King. Um, And King is... And although King is heavily influenced by Lovecraft, he is also in many respects antipodean to him. Because, as I say, you don't often get this lack of hope in Stephen King. You don't often get the situation where whatever force is at play, it cannot be done away with or dispelled to the betterment of humanity. Um, You very often get the opposite. You find some means of enduring, whether it's it's through innocence, through faith, through whatever, through the, the strength of the family unit or the, the love of a, a mother for a child or something to that effect. You often get a redemptive aspect to King's fiction, which you don't get in Lovecraft at all. There is no redemption in Lovecraft whatsoever. None. It is entirely nihilistic and hopeless and that's very interesting i find that absolutely fascinating about about uh, lovecraft now another very fascinating relationship that i perceive which i find again really interesting is that between lovecraft and barker now unlike king king actively celebrates lovecraft and his influence upon his work barker does not if you go and read barker's blog um or you read his, the stuff on his website, There's a, or some of the interviews that he conducted a while back, Varka fucking hates Lovecraft. He absolutely loathes him. And a lot of writers do. Despite his influence, a lot of people and writers and readers do. And I can fully understand that. In the same way I can understand the, the, the anger and the disgust and the fury with which people respond to, say, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis... Um, there is this uh, phenomena where people read the Chronicles of Narnia as as children, enjoy it as children, then start to learn what Lewis was trying to do with those books, and then realise that he was attempting to manipulate and program them with his own um, peculiarly Christian mindset and they respond very negatively to it and they come to loathe him um there's a very good interview with alan garner the author of the weird stone of brisingerman amongst others um and alan garner was a contemporary of c.s lewis's and he absolutely loathes the man he describes lewis as a corrupter of innocence and of imagination and of childhood and he talks about how there are not many writers who he loathes for their work but lewis is one of them and i understand why i really do i mean i actually i went through that period i i loved the chronicles of narnia when i was a kid they were probably one of the very earliest works of fiction i read i remember reading them at the age of five you know the whole lot of them and loving them absolutely loving them i remember one particular period um when i was in my sort of 11 12 when i started suffering from chronic insomnia one summer night i read them all because I couldn't sleep. I read them all in one go. Um, And that was an experience. That was a real experience. Um, But I did have that reaction when I started to realise what he was doing. Um, Especially when I read The Last Battle and realised that it's it's a hideously racist piece of work. Um, Everyone who is not white, who is not, who does not sort of promote very middle-class English values and who doesn't believe in Aslan, essentially, who is God, you know, um, basically gets sent to hell. You know, they're all evil. And also, the book celebrates the death of children. 
it absolutely celebrates the death of children, um, which is a really, truly brr, hideous thing. However, and I, I did have that very extreme reaction to it, and I kind of disregarded the Chronicles of Narnia for a time. Um, but my my reproach has softened somewhat in recent years. I, Again, because it's because of reading about Lewis himself. I mean, I profoundly disagree with the man's the, the perspectives that the man began to espouse when he converted to a particularly fundamentalist and literalist um, form of Christianity. I profoundly disagree with him. But I understand why he did it. I mean, the man like Lovecraft was really damaged, really profoundly traumatised by the death of his wife um, and the deaths of his children. You know, he he was i would say he probably had a nervous breakdown and probably went a little bit mad and what the form of christianity he embraced provided was hope it was a kind of salve and hope that he might see them again it's very sad um and from that perspective i can read the chronicles of narnia again and appreciate them for what they are appreciate the qualities they have and just well disregard the problems that they have or even appreciate them on that level too because they are cultural artifacts they do talk about they are expressions of the reader of, of the writer for better or for worse they express what the writer was feeling and thinking and trying to evoke at the time and they have merit in that regard they do have merit in that regard it's it's one of the reasons why I have real problems with censorship of art and material on the basis that it contains offensive material, on the basis that it contains racist language, for example, or that it contains homophobic language. And for those out there, I, I am gay. I identify as a gay man. But I would never, ever have it. I would never want a work that has a homophobic perspective to be censored on that basis i really wouldn't especially especially cultural artifacts you know from times when homophobia was somewhat more acceptable and rife because they tell you about that era they tell you about the perspectives and the injustices that were pervasive they it is required for them to be that way and to be retained in their legitimacy because they stand as lessons of how not to do it of how not to operate and in that they have a kind of worth there is a thing at the moment with um, Disney, for example. Now, Disney and Warner Brothers both produced lots of work in their earlier eras that is horrendously offensive, massively racist, massively offensive to numerous demographics. I would never want those cartoons censored or removed from public discourse because they tell you, they act as sort of time capsules. They act as expressions of what was acceptable at the time and of the evils and the um the bigotries that were pervasive that were just casually pervasive and in that regard they have a kind of worth you can go back and look at what was acceptable during those eras and you can say well that was terrible that was really awful so we've moved on since then we have changed since then um it also means that we can we can take these companies, these vast edifices to account. We can bring them to account. They cannot sort of whitewash their own histories. They cannot go back and remove these works from history and say, oh, no, we've always been fine. We've always been OK. No, there was a time when we were not. There was a time when we were horrifically racist when we were terribly offensive and if you go back into the 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 very old days of warner brothers and of disney they were very very much so um the same is true of the chronicles of narnia and of similar works i would not want them to be censored they have worth in that regard as cultural artifacts um also if those works don't exist, then they they cannot provide context for other works that combat them. For example, um, without the Chronicles of Narnia, as unpleasant as it can be, you have no His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. You have no His Dark Materials. And His Ma Dark Materials is a very good example of how on a, a longer time frame, on a particular time frame, something beautiful can be inspired by something bigoted and racist and unpleasant um philip pullman wrote his dark materials as a tonic and as a response to 
the Chronicles of Narnia. He wanted to create the antithesis to the Chronicles of Narnia, a book that is a children's fantasy that extols the virtues of reason and of science and of questioning um, and of anti-authoritarianism. Um, whereas C.S. Lewis's work bows to authority, it, it enshrines unthinking enslavement to authority and unquestioning obedience. Um, his Dark Materials extols the opposite. Um, it is this incredibly life-affirming celebration of what it is to be a child, of what it is to be free in your own mind and your own imagination. And if you don't have works like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, with all of its hideous bigotry, you don't have his dark materials and you don't have all of the positive work that and sort of life-affirming stuff that comes from that. So arbitrarily and sort of unthinkingly censoring works that, that might be considered offensive to particular demographics can have a very deleterious effect. You do not have people getting angry, getting inspired by this stuff, and therefore creating work that is beautiful and life-affirming and has incredibly positive impact as a result. And this is also true of Lovecraft. This is also true of Lovecraft. A lot of positive work has come in response to Lovecraft and his racism and his, his anti-Semitism and whatnot, but also due to the more positive aspects of his work um, and that is a wonderful thing that is an absolutely wonderful thing um, it's a really good example of how something beautiful and life-affirming and positive can come from something that may be considered negative it's absolutely beautiful the fact that you can have like um the work of brian lumley who works almost exclusively in lovecraft's universe or the um the parody works that Neil Gaiman has written or the the work of Ramsey Campbell that occurs in Lovecraft's universe or if you go into if you go onto Amazon and search for Lovecraftian fiction there are entire collections of Lovecraft in like 1950s American settings Lovecraft in postmodern British settings my my friend uh, Rich Hawkins who is another writer um uh, uh, one of my uh, writer friends, he writes Lovecraftian fiction, and most of it is set in a sort of postmodern British setting, um, sort of like an urban British setting, like a working class British setting, and it's wonderful. It's it takes Lovecraft's imagery and his nihilism and his metaphysics and transplants it into that setting, and it has application there. You wouldn't have that. You would not have that without Lovecraft, Bloodborne. Bloodborne, the video game Bloodborne from from uh, from the uh, the the studio from Software, that is directly inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and has some of the most exquisite imagery you will ever find in a video game in a work of horror. Full stop. Amnesia: The Dark Descent, an entirely Lovecraftian horror game, which, by the by, I have on my PS4, and I believe after I've done, um, I've done Bloodborne, I will go and do a, a let's play of that, and I will talk about the Lovecraftian influence in it. Um, you wouldn't have these things. It's a fantastic example. I think Lovecraft's fiction stands as a fantastic example of how not only censorship that comes from on high that tells you you cannot read this because it contains this offensive material, but self-censorship, the stuff where you go, oh, I won't read that because it contains racism or whatever, it can stunt you. It can actually stunt your breadth and scope of literature because the raw fact of the matter is if you're not going to read this stuff on the basis that its creators were racist, then you're going to have to not read Poe. Edgar Allan Poe, you can't read. Bram Stoker, you can't read. Um, who else can't you read? Quite a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, quite a lot of writers whose work is so enshrined, so powerful, so brilliant. Um, you're not going to be able to if you're going to censor, censor yourself on that basis. There comes a point when the work is wiser than the human being, than the creator, and has merit beyond the human being themselves. Um, 
it's a very sad thing. Sometimes it's a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, it's particularly pertinent at the moment because you have this... Um, there's quite a lot of scandals going on, particularly on the internet in Hollywood at the moment, where we are learning that people whose work we might enjoy... That it's being revealed that they've been doing some very terrible things, that they, they may be rapists or they may be sexual abusers or harassers or or child abusers or whatever. And it's a very difficult thing to deal with. It is a very difficult thing to deal with, but sometimes the work is wiser. Sometimes very good work comes from very terrible people and it can have positive impact and if you can take something positive from the work of someone who was terrible or who had terrible characteristics then something good has come of something horrendous and that you've made something good from a her and horrendous situation or circumstance and there is worth in that there is something to be said for that you know the raw fact of the matter is you would probably learn that if you went into it, if you actually explored it, most of the people whose work you love were probably or are probably terrible people in some way, shape or form. They've almost certainly done terrible things because we've all done terrible things. We've all done terrible things. Human beings are not they are not stick figures. They are not child's drawings. They are these bizarre, fractal, ephemeral, contradictory entities that are many layered and many faced and many faceted and have so many depths and so many masks and faces you don't know anyone you love to think you do i love to think i do we don't we don't know anyone we genuinely don't we know the faces they choose to show to us on particular platforms and that's it that's it we ourselves are complex and contradictory um, and we tell ourselves, we show ourselves particular faces that are not entirely true, that are simplified, that are, that are mythologized to certain degrees because we want to be perceived in particular ways. That's what human beings are. That's what, and we have to accept that to a certain degree. That doesn't mean that we don't condemn their actions. That doesn't mean that we don't stand up against injustice, that we don't... Um, that doesn't mean that we don't comment, that we stay silent. However, when it comes to created works, the work of terrible people and work that even expresses the the characteristics and the perspectives they held that are or were terrible may still have worth. They may still have worth. And even in that respect, in the, uh, the terribleness that they express, they have degrees of worth. Um, it's a matter of stepping back. It's a matter of looking at the work and saying, well, I can or I cannot handle this. Um, I, I can handle this, I can work with this, or I can't. And if you can't, then fine. But please, please, please do not promote censorship. Do not promote um, a, a, a state where we cannot discuss this subject matter because it leads to very dark places. It is leading to very dark places. We certainly have a situation at the moment where certain political persuasions and certain cultural persuasions are reacting in very spontaneous and very uncritical ways whereby certainly we who produce fiction are finding it difficult to explore particular concepts and particular subjects because we can't write about it legitimately we can't write legitimately racist or homophobic characters because if they used to, if you want to write if you want to explore racism or homophobia or any particular bigotry or prejudice you have to be able to write about it legitimately and that means you have to use the language you have to be able to use the epith epithets you have to be able to write these characters as they operate in reality um otherwise you can't explore it legitimately you get this softened watered down vaguely comic book or simplistic um or anodyne uh, reflection of the reality that has no impact that has no punch um, and that's a problem and I'm sad to say you do have particular political persuasions at the moment reacting in very very uncritical ways they see the words they see the terms they see the epithets and they just react they don't think well in what context is that being used is that character using a racial or, or homophobic or misogynistic slur because 
the writer is trying to explore and indeed condemn racism and homophobia and misogyny or are they promoting it you know but you're just getting people who are reacting and that's scary you are getting this policing of language and it's not sadly i mean i i would love to say um we have to be able to write and create legitimately we have to be able to portray these characters um and to portray them as they are for them to have impact for there to have for them to have verisimilitude the the impression of reality they have to act in real ways and that often means using the epithets that often means acting in hideous hideous ways and we have to be able to do it unambiguously without fear that we're going to attract some reactionary response it's a dangerous state of affairs and lovecraft is very peculiar in that regard he is very peculiar because he does in many respects i mean it's not overt it is not something that it's not something that dominates his stories or at least predominates them but he does promote these archaic views via his work um what i would say is that that aspect of them is kind of tangential it's it's removed from the main cut and thrust of the stories primarily what lovecraft is going for is a cosmic horror it's a sort of humanitarian horror in its own peculiar way um it's not the notion that oh these filthy foreigners are coming in here and destroying everything it's that it doesn't matter because everything corrodes and everything is going to dissolve and everything is going to be destroyed um, regardless of what humanity does it's about the corrosive and um the dissolute nature of the universe and of existence within it it's about humanity's wider place and to appreciate lovecraft's work you've got really got to look at that you've really got to look at that aspect of it and just um take on board the um the qualities and the subjects that are more um that make basically make you hiss and uh, draw your lips back over your teeth um uh, when you read about them it takes that kind of effort to appreciate lovecraft but if you can do that if you can do that then you will find some of the most inventive efflorescent and elaborate horror in existence some of the imagery in lovecraft's work the the monsters the creatures that he creates they're designed they are deliberately designed to be alienating lovecraft over describes them a lot of the time he attaches anatomical details to them that you just you they're not designed to be to be literally envisaged that's the whole point they're supposed to be beyond your ability to imagine and perceive which is why i find i often find attempts to capture them visually a little bit um problematic i find them misconceived a lot of the time um the very effort if you can capture them visually then you limit them they're designed so that even the image of them uh, the, the the thought of them acknowledging them is supposed to be able to drive you mad so yeah there is a problem there is a problem with trying to envisage these entities that said the the descriptions are so florid and so interesting and the the images that crop up in your mind you can actually almost feel yourself your imagination going a bit too far you know almost tipping you over into these states of madness because they are so alien they're so bizarre i mean lovecraft's elder things the the ancient species that by all accounts um is largely responsible for seeding conscious life throughout the universe the evolutionary principles that ultimately resulted in conscious life including humanity the elder things they he describes them in at the mountains of madness which is probably lovecraft's greatest work certainly from my perspective um as these cucumber bodied ribbed entities with a starfish shaped foot at the base and a starfish shaped head at the top and from the starfish head come all manner of tendrils that have these starship sh- starfish shaped suckers at the ends and they have multiple wings coming out of them they're almost impossible to envisage 
They're so bizarre. They're so alien, these creatures. Um, and yet they have these very identif- identifiable characteristics. They're not just monsters. They are a species. They're a civilization. They create cities and they have science and art and they, they have agriculture. It's so weird. It's so weird. There is very much in that story an enormous influence on science fiction, um, the you know on very broad sort of like cosmological space opera science fiction as well. The science fiction that celebrates in creating weird alien civilizations. There is an enormous influence there. It's quite wonderful. It's quite, quite wonderful. And it's kind of sad to me, it is sad to me, that you have to sort of unpick Lovecraft in order to talk about him and to celebrate his influence on other things. You have to tackle the um, the less pleasant aspects of him as a man and his, and his work. You just have to. It's just the way of it. Um, but when you get to celebrating the guy's work, it's, it's, almost impo- it's as impossible to express how significant his work is as it is to describe the creatures that he tries to describe uh, or to envisage them, at least. Uh, he is everywhere. The man is everywhere. And I think it's wonderful that the work of a man who could have been such a negative force, who could have been such a negative influence given his perspectives, has become so inspiring to so many people. It has brought, rather than limiting their perspectives, as you'd imagine the work of someone who was so overtly racist would, it's actually broadened their perspectives. It's opened their minds to this, to images and to notions they wouldn't have otherwise even conceived of and that is a very wonderful thing i am a huge believer in taking the positive away from something that could ostensibly be very negative and lovecraft is probably an excellent example of that very principle of that very principle without lovecraft no king no Stephen King. Um, arguably, no Clive Barker. I mean, I imagine Barker himself would refute that. He doesn't like Barker. He doesn't like Lovecraft on a number of levels. He doesn't like him. He doesn't like his prose. He finds it leaden. And I, I understand that totally. If you can't get Lovecraft because of his prose, I totally get that. He's very hard to like in that regard. Um, he finds it sexless, which, of course, for Barker is a thing. For me, that's usually a thing. You will struggle outside of Tolkien to find a more sexless universe than Lovecraft. I would argue I would argue Lovecraft is even more sexless than Tolkien's. At least in Tolkien's there is romance. There are marriages. You know, you have Arwen and Aragorn, you have um Faramir and um Eowyn. There are married couples and whatnot in Tolkien's work Lovecraft is uniquely sexless the only time the notion of sex comes up is for the purposes of procreation and it is almost always horrendous it's almost always like some tentacled other thing um or or elder god that impregnates a woman and it's not it's not explored it's not expressed it's not graphic he just it, it, it's told in retrospect usually as a result of the the hideous birth um lovecraft himself was a uniquely sexless man i think i there are theories that he may have been gay i don't think that's true i i'm of the opinion he was probably largely asexual although he was married um to a jewish woman of all things I, it's one of the many 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 layered contradictions of Lovecraft's personality he was married for a brief period to a Jewish woman um who he did love very much clearly um but she just by all accounts he was very difficult to live with and ultimately largely due to monetary things he was very impecunious during his life she had to leave him she had to leave him because he was a difficult man to live with um very neurotic and largely penniless um very very hard man to get on with um Barker dislikes him for that reason and I I usually find sexless universes rather difficult to get on with um uh Barker also dislikes him uh just because he 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 doesn't see any merit in his work he finds the the nihilism of Lovecraft uh pointless he finds it pointless which I am moribund which I understand I totally understand because Barker's universes largely aren't they largely are not 
um, nihilistic or misanthropic to any degree. And it's I, it's interesting that I appreciate them both. I mean, I, I adore Barker's fiction by and large, and I I actually adore Lovecraft's fiction by and large, but for on very different levels and for very, very different reasons. Um, but it is, I would say, that there... I mean, Barker cannot escape the fact that there is an influence, even if it's unconscious. I mean, the the elaboration of horror, for example, the elaborate monsters that Barker describes are often very Lovecraftian. The... Um, even though Barker's metaphysical principles are often in contrast to Lovecraft, they do sometimes echo it too, in the sense that you do have these vast, unknowable metaphysics that humanity cannot conceive of, that are entirely outside of humanity, and that do drive humanity mad if they touch them. Um, that's very Lovecraftian. That's a very Lovecraftian notion, whether Barker would like it or not. Um... So yeah, it's interesting. It's absolutely fascinating. If you go, you could go and pick any random science fiction or horror work off your shelf, and I guarantee you, you would find a Lovecraft influence or concept somewhere in it. It's like, it's like that notion, um, you know, the genetic concept that all human beings that are alive now are related in some way, shape, or form to Charlemagne or to Genghis Khan because of the way those guys put it about effectively on a long enough time frame we all become related to one another um it's true of lovecraft too in the same way that all horror and science fiction that operates now certainly in the anglophonic world derives in some way shape or form from frankenstein from mary shelley's frankenstein that is also true of lovecraft it's also true of lovecraft on a slightly shorter time frame and that is fascinating to unpick it really is interesting to me anywho i think i may have rambled on um for long enough in this one thank you so much once again for listening to me um if you out there would like to hear me talk about something if there is anything out there you would like me to discuss um i'm thinking about taking a look at uh poppy z bright and billy Mar, uh, aka billy martin in the next one uh because that he is a uh, Billy is a very significant writer in my life and I would I would dearly love to discuss his work. Um, if there is anything you would like me to discuss, please let me know. And uh, thank you once again for listening and for all the feedback. It's enormously appreciated and I will speak with you again very soon. Ta-ta!